Maps. As Rick told you, uh, in Switzerland we had an exceptional situation uh, end of the 80, 1980s where a handful of uh, psychiatrists had an unlimited permission to work with LSD and MDMA and psilocybin um, with patients with no strings attached, so to speak. And I was lucky enough to um, go through therapy, through psychedelic therapy, and receive training in this method at that time, and also to uh, co-assist um, sessions uh, led by those uh, psychiatrists with permission. So uh, that got me on the hook, <laughs> and I stayed with it, and uh, when I saw on the internet that um, Michael and Annie were starting their study. I wrote Rick an email and um, jumped into a plane, and that was the beginning of our collaboration. So uh, I won't repeat much of the things that Michael already talked about because we basically use the same standard protocol, um, but there are some differences that I will try to um, elaborate. I'll talk about um, why MDMA is uh, suitable for the treatment of PTSD, uh, say something about study design and come to our preliminary results. We have um, the, the last patient had the last session beginning of January but we're still uh, at the beginning of data, data analyzation. Uh, if we have time, I'd like to uh, present a case vignette or two and come to the conclusions. Um, as you know, um, um, there were many anecdotal reports before the ban of MDMA that MDMA can be beneficial uh, in the treatment of PTSD and anxiety disorders. And we also saw this in patients treated in Switzerland between 1988 to 93. Uh, Peter Gasser uh, did a retrospective study about this. Okay. It's the wrong set of slides, so I'll continue. It's just the draft <laughs> to not lose time. Here are some, um, uh, some information on MDMA. Please note um, this, the oxytocin and prolactin release. Um, which are known as prime movers for attachment behavior and memory building. I think that's important when we try to understand how MDMA works for PTSD. And the second thing that uh, MDMA um, activates deep frontal orbital regions of the prefrontal cortex. The other things are, we can skip, we can skip this too and uh, come to why people develop PTSD in the first place. It is known for uh, um, uh, quite a time that prolonged stressful and traumatic experiences in early childhood. Uh, Bremner was one of the first to, um, to publish on that, uh, leads to, uh, um, can uh, be a reason for developing PTSD later in life. Um, many subjects uh, show a smaller hippocampus which is hypofunctional or dysfunctional due to genetic predisposition and another reason may be disturbed memory building due to high levels of stress hormones. 
I think, and uh, the last, sorry, the last one, the lack of social support is also, um, in my opinion, uh, um, a, a reason for people running into PTSD. The neuro uh, uh, path of psychology is well known. Um, patients with PTSD can help transfer the traumatic experience into a comprehensive and conscious context of time and space, previous and following autobiographic information. This uh, takes place in the hippocampus and uh, this leads to uh, stimuli connected to the trauma activate the implicit memory traces in the amygdala which lead to an uninhibited fear avoidance arousal reaction. The traumatic memories are then experienced as happening here and now. There's a diagram of how, how I think uh, PTSD works in the brain. Um, when a traumatic, potentially traumatic event happens um, it is relayed directly to the amygdala, the fear centers, and uh, the amygdala have, has strong projections to other brain areas like the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, which are then, if the uh, amygdala is activated enough, are inhibited and will, um, the information coming in will not be processed um, appropriately. And the main um, um, the, hip, the prefrontal cortex is uh, the place where we think that the uh, inhibition of the fear reaction takes place. The prefrontal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, and the frontal orbital cortex are um, have to be activated to significantly inhibit the amygdala in order to, to get the fear down. This is where it takes place. Prefrontal cortex and the frontal orbital cortex here, the amygdala, and here in another view you see the hippocampus. So the therapeutic principles of um, treating PTSD is uh, has three therapeutic ingredients, um, which is nothing else but activated neuron patterns, uh, that is, repetitive re-experiencing of the trauma, um, connected with an activated fear, negative feelings, avoidance pattern. And um, if you want to treat someone successfully, you have to bring them into a simultaneous positive emotional cognitive state of mind which is incongruent with fear and that's what I think MDMA does and this is also called motivational priming. The result will be that uh, when people repetitively experience that nothing harmful is happening now, uh, re-experience trauma, they will learn and not just intellectually, but implicitly, that means by experience, this is not insight, that um, they are safe and nothing harmful is happening to them here now. That leads to a formation of a new fear inhibiting neuronal pattern in the prefrontal cortex. And until this is stable, this needs a long time, and you have to go through these experiences many times. So I'll come to, the, to uh, our study design. This is a, like Michael's and Annie's study, a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled phase two clinical studies. We want to test safety and effectiveness of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Our hypotheses are that MDMA can be well-tolerated and be administered in a clinical therapeutic setting without any serious adverse events. Uh, that full dose leads to greater improvement in PTSD symptoms than active placebo. I will come to that later. And that three sessions will lead to better results compared to only two MDMA sessions. And that treatment gains will remain stable after follow-up 
assessments. We also measure uh, uh, some neurophysiologic measures before and after the treatment that's done in Franz Wollenweiter's lab in the Psychiatric University Hospital in Zurich. Um, I can't tell you much about that. He can <laughs> tell you more. Um, these, this data has not been analyzed yet, and uh, so maybe he can tell you more. We have basically the same inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, our outcomes measure are the collision administered PTSD scale. Uh, the CAPS, Michael uh, uh, told you about that one, and we had as a secondary measure the post-traumatic distress scale, that's a self-report questionnaire filled out by the patients. We have uh, five time points. Um, we had to um, eliminate eliminates time, po uh, time point T4, six months, because of financial <laughs> reasons. We were getting tight with the money. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, in stage one, eight subjects received the full dose of uh, 125 milligrams, followed by a booster dose of 62.5 milligrams uh, after 2.5 hours on three occasions, and four subjects receive active placebo, which is 25 milligrams followed by 12.5. Uh, there's a crossover after unblinding, which takes place three weeks after the last session, and uh, placebo pa patients have a uh, can proceed to stage two with, where they receive the full dose. Uh, after treating uh, five or six of five or six subjects, we saw that we had several uh, what we call non-response to treatment subjects. They did not improve in caps. They felt better, but we weren't getting the same results as Michael and Annie. And so, um, one patient wrote directly to the health authorities in, uh, in Switzerland demanding additional sessions for him. <laughs> <laughs> and they called me up and uh, advised me how to go, uh, how to do it. So we applied for a, an amendment of the protocol and got permission to administer another two sessions with a high dose, which was uh, 150 milligrams. Um, uh, plus uh, a 75 milligram booster. Uh, three patients went on to stage three. So the therapy co consists of a male and female therapist present during the two inductory sessions, all the uh, MDMA sessions, and the day after integrative talking sessions, the morning after. Uh, patients stay at our, at our office they have the same daily phone calls and integrative talking sessions in the weeks between the sessions. Subjects can continue their previous therapy in the same frequency, but they can't start something new during, during the trial. This is uh, where it takes place. That's a patient, her face is blurred, and my wife sitting next to her. We have the, oops, sorry. We have the music here and um, recording all the sessions on, on video. So the therapeutic approach um, and the role of the therapists, it's a non-directive approach with emphasis on experiencing whatever emerges under the influence of the MDRA. Therapists must act synergistic to the MDMA effects, trying to keep them high under the positive emotional cognitive state of mind. And foremost and most important is supporting approach behavior as opposed to avoidance behavior and um, supporting their therapeutic goals, ensuring a safe and reliable and trusted therapeutic relationship, 